All right, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the formation of the Lake Superior Basin. And our theme today is a journey through the history of the creation of, the, of Lake Superior with geologic evidence in the Western Lake Basin. So what I'd like to do is first start off by kind of introducing myself. This is me. Uh, I'm Ranger Steve. I work at the Visitor Center here in Duluth. Uh, I was in the military, as you can see. For six years, I spent in the Navy doing sonar and 17 in the Army doing uh, operations and medicine. Uh, I attended University of Wisconsin Superior and focused on broad field science with a concentration in geology and physics. And uh, I attend Western Carolina University as emergency medical care manager. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I've done some geologic work, uh, some research work in northern Wisconsin what, for my time at UWS, and so I'm kind of familiar with the, the geologic processes of the area, and I'm going to share some of that with you today. All right, so here's our geologic timeline. When we look at the geologic timeline, it's, it's pretty overwhelming. Uh, so this is in millions of years, so 4,000 million years, that equals a bill, 4 billion years. Uh, this is kind of mind boggling, uh, just like when we think of space, it's hard for us to really comprehend the vast distances, distances of space. Uh, so kind of living a, the short human lifetime, we look at the lifetime of rocks and it's kind of like, wow, right? So. Uh, we're going to talk about four main periods that, that are, were important to the, the creation of Lake Superior. We look off in this earlier area, and this is basically the birth of North America uh, through continental accretion. Uh, basically, uh, our continent grew and grew. And so when continents grow, sometimes they, they come apart, and that moves us into the mid-continent rift that that happened uh, about 1.1 billion years ago. Uh, and this is very important to the creation of Lake Superior. We'll get a little more into that as we go on. Uh, and then moving on, we have uh, a period of sedimentation, which is important because it, it basically sets us up for when the last period we're gonna look at, and that's the Ice Age. Now, to kind of give you a, a frame of reference, uh, so this starts about 4.5 billion years ago, and up until about 500 million years ago, there weren't any plants or animals on the, the planet. So a lot of this happened even before the first plants uh, basically came out of the ocean and started covering the land. Uh, and then you can see here, we're basically on the very end of the timeline. Uh, just basically a small sliver of, of geologic time that, that human beings have really been here. So uh, that's where we're going to start from. So in order to provide this evidence, I really want to go over some of the things that we use to, uh, to make sure the science is done correctly so we know when things happen. And some geologic principles that I'd like to talk about. Uh, the first one being the principle of uniformitarianism. We'll also talk about potassium argon dating, which is radiometric dating method, uh, magnetic orientation, faunal succession, and superposition. So let's get started with that. So I'm sure you've all heard of carbon dating. Well, I hope so. Uh, basically, that's how we date living things that have, you know, fossils and things that are carbon based. Well, with rocks, we really can't do that. Again, you saw only for the the, the last half of the uh, or last third, if, if even that, of the geologic timeline, uh, there was no carbon based organisms really. So we have to use potassium argon dating in order to to really look into these things. And what that is is basically when magma comes out of the earth. Uh, it basically all the argon is is expelled as gas, but there's potassium, and where there's potassium, there's also a radio a radioactive isotope of potassium. 
And by looking at this, we can see uh, over time as this radioactive element slowly uh, uh, decays uh, by seeing how much calcium or potassium, sorry, versus how much argon, we can see how old the rock is. So if you look at this, when it's when there's all potassium and no argon, it, it's basically the rock just cooled from magma, right? And we go 1.3 billion years later, and now it's half potassium isotope versus argon isotope. And basically, by using this, we can basically uh, you can't use it for like uh, recent rocks, like within the last 20,000 years, but looking at older older rocks it, it really gives us a, a pinpoint they call it absolute dating uh, of when these rocks occur another way we we use association with rocks is magnetic orientation so if you're not aware uh, uh, you understand what north and south is but it, it's not always north and south the polarity of the earth has switched over time, over the millions and millions of years. And this kind of shows you when the magma comes out and cools, whatever way the, the, the poles are pointing is kind of frozen in those rocks. And so we can take uh, potassium argon dating and say these rocks are from around this time and they should correlate with the way the, uh, the poles of the earth were at that time. So we look here, you have seafloor spreading, and you see on the farther end, some of this is destroyed. It goes with uh, oceanic crust goes back underneath uh, and, and gets destroyed. But what we can see, especially in the wide oceans like the Pacific, is uh, many different time frames of these, uh, and it gives us an idea of when these rocks were created. Not only that, we can use that to take similar rocks and say, okay, the polarity is the same. It must have been created around the same time frame. So you asked, how many times does this happen? Well, uh, basically a cron is an area, a uh, time frame in which the magnetic poles are in one orientation. And then there's a flip and it goes the other way. Basically the northern polarity will be in the, the point south. So if you look at these time frames, uh, you, many of them are pretty short. You have some pretty short time frames in here. Uh, and what's interesting and important to us is look how long our, our last cron that we're in right now has been. And so for scientists, this actually, uh, and this is probably another lecture in itself, but uh, the wandering of the poles and should we expect a, another flip of the magnetic poles anytime soon and what that will mean for our electronics and stuff pretty neat subject if you'd like to look more into that but so this gives us another way to look at uh, uh, like rocks and say okay well these will probably came from around the same time period and you can see these crons go during millions of years and so they give us uh, little snapshots of, of when rocks might have been created, especially oceanic rock. Another way we kind of date rocks and find out when things happen is faunal succession. Now, this is only good within the last, you know, 540 million years. Is, you know, we have plants and stuff to turn into fossils. We have those carbon-based life forms. But how this works is basically if we find a, a, a fossil that we know only uh, was around on Earth from, say, 40 million years ago to uh, 47 million years ago, and we know this fossil here was around from uh, 46 million years ago to uh, uh, 30 million years ago, we know that for these two to be in the same area of dirt, we can kind of, a uh, rock, we can date that rock uh, even closer. So the more fossils we have, the, the more we can narrow down on how old those rocks are. And again, we can use uh, uh, potassium argon dating to verify and to even narrow that down farther. 
And the last is the, uh, the principle of superposition. Now, basically, all this is saying is, is that uh, what, uh, whatever's laid down on top, whether it's, it's tilted a little bit, unless it gets totally flipped over, which rarely happens, whatever's laid down on top is newer and whatever uh, happened lower down in the, the stratum of, of especially uh, sedimentary rock, we, we call these older. So what we see here is what we call a fault. And you can see that this, this is offset. So I is up here on, on this one, it's down here on this one. But so we might have an older H next to a newer I. But we using the principle of superposition, we can say, well, it's in this location on, on how these rocks were laid down. So we can say this is older than that, that's older than that. And that's that basic principle. And the last thing we didn't really talk about is the principle of uniformitarianism. Now, the principle of uniformitarianism is just simply saying the processes that we see today happen the same way in the past and will most likely happen the same way in the future. So it's just like weathering and erosion happened in the past, just like it's happening today. So what we see today, we can uh, suppose it was exactly like that in the past. All right, now there's a few things, a few uh, rocks we have to go over uh, that I'm going to uh, reference when we get to some of the evidence. And this will give you a little background on some of these rocks. So basalt, if you're familiar with the Duluth Superior area, you're definitely familiar with this rock. It's uh, dark in texture, uh, gray to black. Uh, it does contain iron magnesium because uh, it's a mafic rock. That's a mafic is a heavy, uh, volcanic rock that contains uh, magnesium and iron. So you can see uh, sometimes uh, if water is is er eroding the rock or falling over it, you might see some reddish rust kind of stains, and that's from the iron content. Uh, the big thing to, to see here, though, is the crystals are very tiny. You almost need a microscope to see them, right? So it has kind of a uniform look, but kind of a grainy texture, whereas the intrusive version of this rock, a rock that cooled at a slower rate, uh, basically the crystals had time to form and get bigger. These are chemically similar rocks, but the uh, gabbro you see here, and we have some exposed in Duluth due to uh, uh, uplifting and erosion, uh, you can see that it has much larger crystals. Uh, if you're familiar with the Duluth Superior Area, the Enger Tower is basically built on a big uh, Plutana gabbro, and you can find it throughout the Duluth Superior area. But we're gonna talk more about where these rocks are and what they mean to our presentation today. Another common one that you can find in the area is rhyolite. And it's, uh, it can be light pink to gray. As you can see here, this picture has inclusions in it, which is uh, pretty common. Uh, but if you look, just like the basalt and the gabbro, granite is basically the uh, metamorphic uh, version of rhyolite. So basically, it's it's not just the cooling slower. Uh, it is. It's the intrusive version. But uh, it also can come about through metamorphic change, and that's just through heat and pressure. But if you look, it can be pink, just like the original rock, or it can be white, that's sometimes gray. But it's it, just so you understand that they're they're chemically similar, and and they're felsic in nature, which means that it has more uh, it has more silica, more lighter elements, feldspar. Uh, so it, there's an important distinction. Whereas basalt and gabbro are these heavy iron and magnesium rocks, the rhyolite and granite are much lighter. And another rock, which kind of goes along with the more the rhyolite and the granite is uh, anorthosite, which we have some around here and we'll talk a little bit more where that's located. But as you can see, it kind of looks quartzy. It's got a quartzy-ish color to it. Uh, it kind of looks waxy. And uh, we'll talk, again, it's felsic. It's more, it has the, the, the silicate nature, the lighter uh, crustal rock. And then, 
I'm sure many in the area, if you're if you're from around here, agates are a, a, a fun rock to go out and find because of their the, the nature, the way they look. Uh, basically, it's not uh, an igneous rock, which is volcanic, you know, and it's not sedimentary rock. Uh, it's kind of a combination of the two, sort of. It's basically, they're usually found in the volcanics, the igneous rocks, but uh, it, they come about from water seeping through those rocks, picking up those silicate mer minerals, and then depositing uh, uh, chalcedony and quartz in layers. And so we get this really beautiful look. And we'll talk a little bit about where they come from. So next, we have sedimentary rock. Now, if you're from northern Wisconsin, you're probably more familiar with these in Bayfield area, Ashland. Uh, so basically sandstone is basically sand uh, type of material that was deposited and then uh, compressed and over time became rock. And they, it, because it's from minerals and rock flag, uh, fragments, we call that class. Uh, they can be tons of different colors. The main composition being quartz and feldspar, those lighter materials again. But uh, just know that it, it can come in a lot of different uh, flavors, so to speak, because of the content can change based on those little grains of sand. And then we have shale. Shale's uh, really important to the formation of the Great Lakes, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the evidence. But just to familiarize it, it, it basically comes from mud, clay, and silt. And it's, again, compressed over time and uh, it can contain iron oxide. And if you notice, it looks kind of like the basalt. So how do we differentiate these? Well, shale and, and its counterpart slate and schist, and they all have those layers from being laid down that, that, uh, over time. And that's what sedimentary rock is. So these layers are laid down then compressed and turned into rock. And that's where you, where you have these layers here you're really not gonna see that in the basalt. All right, so let's get started on continental accretion. Here we go. North America is made up of a lot of different parts, right? So uh, just looking here, the superior craton, that's, that's the center, that's the core of our, our North American craton. Everything else kinda came along and collided with it. And these are billions of years basically these times here. And then here's some names of the, of the given times. And you can see that uh, many of them came from the, the south and up and, and, and into us. And those are the important ones to making the, the Great Lakes area what it is. So how does continental accretion come about? Well, here you have the superior craton. And here you have oceanic crust. And then you have a subduction zone. Basically what that is, is that oceanic crust is being forced down because it's, it's that mafic rock, right? That heavy uh, iron and magnesium rock that uh, when something like this comes along, these, this is those lighter silico, uh, silica minerals, they tend to try to float above the, that heavier rock. And we call this continental crust. So basically the, that those lighter materials are running over the top and, you, and you, they're being pushed by uh, oceanic crust behind it, but you have subduction zone. And when this melts, it, oftentimes you have volcanoes. So as this comes in, it smashes in to the superior craton and basically becomes a part of it. And so we see a lot of classic rock in this area because you can see here with right here it's actually highlighting the Niagara Fault, which is a little bit east of us. But uh, the same process happened along a, a east-west line. So this same process that we're looking at right here happened in the, in our same area. And behind it you see the Marshfield terrain. So another one came behind it. And having these two island chain uh, continental crustal rocks smashed together uh, caused basically a fold thrust belt. Now this is important. So we see here what this looks like for our area. If, if this is Duluth, we have the Pinocchian Mountains. So this is that fold thrust belt that, that came in basically just south of Duluth. 
because this, this area is coming in from the south, Duluth is in the northern part of this, those rocks are uplifted, right? And so they went up as high, like 15,000 feet, if you can imagine, uh, being in Duluth and looking at a mountain range that looks like the Alps. Pretty cool if you ask me. Uh, uh, I think those mountain ranges are beautiful. But what you have to remember is at this time, uh, you know, we're talking millions of years ago, uh, or billions of years ago, sorry, that uh, there's no plants. So these mountains tended to erode faster because they didn't have the, the, the plants and the, the roots holding things together as well. So as fast as these mountains were uplifted, they were eroded away almost as fast. Uh, they were basically eroded down to rolling hills in uh, 100 million years, which in geologic times really isn't that long at all. So this kind of highlights this slide. Uh, basically, we're looking at the, the superior craton, right? And we see lots, of, it was built of, of lots of other plutons of volcanic activity and other, you know, uh, other island chains smashing into it. And basically we have these, these tectonic zones. But what's important here is, so we see the Pinocchian orogeny. Now this wasn't a, a north-south event. It actually was an east-west event. What you don't see here is, is it kind of ran all the way along that whole east-west area. So basically we had this big uplift and then this big erosion, which left a lot of sediment and sedimentary rock all around the area. And then something very important happened. And it, it, it's happened around the world in different places, but when a continent comes together, there's a possibility of a rift. And here we see the mid-continental rift. So that's going to bring us to, this is 1.1 billion years ago. 1.1 billion years ago, uh, the young North American continent, it's not even fully complete yet, uh, has a heat plume underneath it. And you see this mantle heat plume. And what this causes is uplift, just like hot air blowing, uh, you know, tends to rise. So does this molten hot rock that's hotter than the rock around it. And it causes uplift and stretching. And we call these extensional forces. And these extensional forces cause weak areas in the crust to fall. Now you can see the fault here. We'll talk a little bit more, more about the faults, but this is a normal fault. A normal fault is basically when you have an overhanging end. So if you were to lift this up, the overhanging end would, would be going up. That's a reverse fault. This is a normal fault. It, it's just like it, as the extensional forces come, the land tends to slide down. So we have this faulting, and in between these faults, we have some plastic rock, and that's just torn up boulders as the, you know, these massive uh, pieces of land just slowly slide against each other. And what this allowed is that hot, uplift of rock to come out and as you can see here so through the faulting area through these weak zones in the crust this lava slowly comes up and when it does it it flows over the area now remember continental rock tends to be light it tells it tends to be felsic in nature whereas mantle rock tends to be mafic uh, and so it's that heavier uh, magnesium and iron rich rock. Now this is pretty much as far as the mid-continental rift in North America went. If it were to have continued, you can see uh, it keeps spreading and then basically the ocean comes in and it keeps spreading and now you have a, basically an ocean. So if the, the mid-continental rift had continued, uh, it's kind of interesting to think about it, but Minnesota would have been oceanfront property. Kind of, kind of neat if you think about it. And then, basically, the east coast of the United States would be somewhere out in the Atlantic Ocean. But luckily, we stopped uh, right about at the end of, of stage four here. And what that did for us uh, is basically uh, it put this large amount of heavy material on the surface. 
Now, the reason it stopped, uh, there's debate about it, there, whether the, the tectonic plate moved uh, too much for that to con continue happening, it moved from the plume, or the plume stopped it uh, altogether itself. So looking at the whole rift system, and usually when you have a mid-continental rift system, uh, they have three legs, as you can see here. That it's not really shown well in our rift system, our failed rift system, but it most likely would have happened. Uh, East Africa and the Red Sea is a good example of that, that tri-rift system. So you, after this, you can take a look at a map and just imagine that that process was happening here in North America. So you can see how long it went though, and you can see the clastic sediments. So that's the place where the, that rifting happened and those faults occurred. And then you have that clastic rock from, from sedimentation and rubbing of the rocks. And then you, we have all this volcanic rock filling this area that would become especially the Lake Superior region. So we're gonna take a little stop. And the first stop is going to be just north of Castle Danger. It's uh, uh, north of Two Harbors and so, uh, just south of Silver Bay. It's called Gooseberry Falls. Uh, and I'm going to play a video of it for you. Sorry, we seem to be having a little difficulty here. Gonna bring you back and try that again. There we go. All right, today we're at uh, Gooseberry Falls. Now this is a good place to actually explore some of the basaltic flows that happened 1.1 million years ago. Now, the area is covered by different flows over different periods of time. And you can see from the different falls areas and the different colors of the basaltic lava, uh, how it happened over time. Another interesting feature here is there's Pohoi hoi flows, or very non-biscuit flows, almost like water. So it leaves this puddle-like uh, illusion of when the lava cools. Another big thing that happens in this area that you can visually see is Lake Superior agates are formed in lava like this. You can see a lot of the little circles and holes around my feet. Some of these are caused by the river, but other ones are caused from having air pockets trapped in the lava. And as water precipitates down through that, that rock, it leaves silica, chalcedony, and uh, quartz. And that's what, these are what form our agates. And as, as the environment erodes away the, the, the basalt, those agates become free and head down to the lake where we All right, so uh, you can see uh, basically uh, that's uh, where the Lake Superior agates come from. It, uh, so the agates actually are uh, more resistant to erosion because of the, their silicate nature. They have, tend to have a hardness that's harder than basalt. So the basalt gets eroded away and these agates get freed. It's pretty neat, but that's where they come from. So th this is again, just looking at uh, the mid-continent rift system, and you can see the Duluth complex. Now this was more intrusive rock. So when we're talking about, uh, we, you have some more of that uh, gabbro and 
uh, marble, or not marble, but uh, granite. Uh, and again, it ran all the way down to Kansas and all the way back up. And they believe it went also to the east of Michigan. And there's still research going on how far it actually went to the east. So for us, uh, we're going to look here at some importance of this, this mid-continental rift system for our area. One thing is it, it tended to uh, make these faults. And with these faults came uh, exposure of, you can see nickel, copper, and platinum group elements. Uh, there was some extremely rich native copper in the uh, Michigan Kiwanan Peninsula there. And uh, basically up here, of course, we're all familiar with the Iron Range and the, the ores that were exposed in that area. So here we have a, a question for you. When did the, the mid-continent rift occur in North America? So feel free to put input into your uh, this poll here, and then I'll I'll reveal the information in just a moment. All right, good job. Yeah, 1.1 billion years ago. 4.5 billion years ago is when the, uh, basically the, the birth of the earth, the oldest rocks that we can find are from around that time. But yeah, 1.1 billion years ago, Good, great job. All right. So next, uh, we're gonna head up here to uh, just north of Silver Bay. Tetaguchi State Park. Now this uh, gives us a little different perspective. Uh, at Gooseberry Falls, we were looking at those basaltic lava flows, you know, those really non-viscous, you know, almost like water lava flows. And in contrast, not very far from it, if you see on the map there, it's just up 61, a little bit north, uh, we have a different type of lava flow. All right, here we are just north of Silver Bay, northeast uh, at Palisade Head. Now we've talked about all this basalt lava flows going throughout the area through the mid-continental rift. But something we haven't talked about is as this warm, uh, extremely hot, excuse me, lava comes up through these rocks, it's, it's also melting this, this continental rock that is, is felsic in nature, meaning it has a high silica and feldspar content versus the mafic basalt, which is high in iron and magnesium. So as these rocks get melted, we end up with lava flows that aren't basalt. They're actually uh, rhyolite. Here, where we're standing on is called Palisade Head, and it's a large rhyolite flow. And this, this rock uh, stands out in stark contrast. It's definitely lighter, and it not only in color but in makeup and if we look over here we have shovel point uh, both palisade head and shovel point are ryol rhyolitic flows again uh, they are felsic and made up of lighter elements and it, it kind of shows that as these magmas and lavas come through the the crustal rock they melt some of the other rock and do lead to differences in the mineral content of these flows All right, so it's pretty neat to think that there, there's such a contrast in, in the makeup of these rocks that are basically coming from the same place, this mid-continent rift. And the reason for it is called fractional crystallization. 
and you, you can see uh, basically uh, iron and magnesium tend to, to settle early and uh, basically this this has to do with how much water content, how much water is in the, the area, the pressure and the temperature. And it causes different crystals to settle out at different times. So once those, uh, the original, if you see here in time one, the original mafic melt is, is basically that basalt, but as those, that iron and that, uh, that magnesium tends to settle out, then you end up with a very felsic uh, lava flow. One thing to really understand about this is a very non-viscous uh, mafic lava flow could go miles and miles and miles. It's, it's actually, it's, it runs, it's kind of watery. Whereas the more felsic in nature you get, the more viscous those get, the more thick kind of like Play-Doh. So they don't tend, once the rock becomes uh, felsic in nature, it doesn't tend to travel very far from when it became that. So it gives us an idea where these processes are happening. And uh, Palisade Head and Shovel Point are really good examples of those of, of this process. There's also another really good example of this happening. And it's right next to Gooseberry Falls, again, just north of it on 61. Oh, and if you if you want to go see Palisade Head and Shovel po or yeah, Shovel Point, uh, Teddy Gooch State Park, and they have parking lots where you can hike to the top of it. Now, looking at Split Rock Lighthouse is another example. Remember Gooseberry Falls? We have these basaltic lava flows all over the place, but right next to it, there's a different kind of flow, and it's not it, it's not a rhyolite flow, which is interesting. So let's take a look at that. We're here at Split Rock Lighthouse uh, to look at an interesting rock formation. Basically, the lighthouse is on top of a, no a northersite deposit. Now, like Shovel, uh, Shovel Point and Palisade Head, it's a lighter form of minerals than the basalt. Uh, basically, a northersite, like the lighthouse stands on, is a uh, calcium-rich feldspar and uh, zircon. Uh, Another place it's found is in the lighter spots on the crust of the moon. Now, through uh, fractional crystallization, basically these lighter elements were melted down in the, the magma and lava, and uh, they start to rise because they're, they're the lighter elements, and then they come together and form these deposits. Uh, so you can see the erosion didn't hit as hard here. Uh, it is a little bit harder of a mineral, so it's more resistant to Lake Superior's erosion effects. All right. So to kind of recap, uh, really nice. Uh, you can obviously go visit Split Rock Lighthouse. It's on 61 and it's well marked. So if you're heading north on the North Shore, uh, I highly recommend visiting that area. Uh, and again, so we see we have uh, areas of rhyolite and areas of a northersite, which is interesting. But a really important part about all this is all this heavy mafic rock, even though we have these instances of, of felsic rock, all this heavy mafic rock is, is causing the area to sink because you have this light crustal uh, rock and then inside of it and above it, now you have this heavy mafic rock. So it's causing the whole general region to sink uh, from this weight. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about how, how that affected the area. But so basically we've already talked about uh, the uh, continental accretion up into the mountain building in the area, which then was basically eroded down, and then the mid-continent rift came along. And 
So now we're, we're heading into the time when we actually do have uh, plants beginning to start on land. And this, these areas are time of sedimentation. We have water, so you have all this sedimentary, or the, not sedimentary, but uh, mafic igneous rock that's super heavy, basically causing the crust in the area to sink. And what happens when an area sinks and the surrounding area is higher, it fills with water. And when it fills with water, you have deposition. And this is how most sedimentary rock is made. So now we have times of deposition. And during these times of deposition, we have more continental accretion going on. Uh, we have the Grenville slab of land crashing into the North American continent. So we had these extensional forces during the mid-continental rift. Now those are gonna reverse, and it's kind of interesting what happens. So when we look at crustal forces, there are three main types of faults that happen. We've already seen normal fault, right? The normal fault is when the hanging wall slides down. A reverse fault is when compressional forces come together and push uh, the hanging wall up and over. And then you have the strike slip fault, which isn't really in our area, but uh, a, a really good example of it is like the San Andreas fault over in California, the one you always hear about it. Those, it's the one that causes all those earthquakes. So we're gonna head uh, uh, to another spot. This one's in uh, Wisconsin. It's just south of Superior on 53. It's called Amnicon Falls. Uh, one thing I'm gonna say about it is it's on the Douglas Fault and the Douglas Fault also runs through Patterson, which is another place you can see what you're gonna see in the next video. Hi everybody, our search for evidence brings us to northern Wisconsin. This is Amnicon Falls State Park. Now we talked about the mid-continental rift and the, the basalt that was extruded during that time. Well, here in Amnicon Park, uh, there was a depositional period afterwards. A river flowed through this area over on top of that basalt and it made sandstone, as you see here. You can see the dry layers of sandstone that were laid down long ago. When we look into the center of the river, you can see two boulders. Those boulders are definitely not sandstone, they're basalt. And they were carried down from the fault area, which if you come to the upper falls, which I'm going to take you right now, These are the upper falls at Amnicon Park. It highlights the actual fault zone. It's very loud down here, so I'm gonna have to speak up. So you can see here to my right, we have a layer of basalt on top of a layer of what's called breca. Now breca is basically the zone where the rocks have moved and compressed against each other and made a gravelly-like substance. So if we look to the left, we have sandstone. Same thing right here. To my right, we have a uplifted basalt. So what happened here? About 500 million years ago, there was compressional forces. Remember when we talked about the mid-continental rift was extensional, falling apart. Well, now it is, it's called an inverse. There starts to be compressional uh, forces in the area. That causes a fault. This fault is called the Douglas Fault. And basically what happened is this sandstone used to be on top of this basalt. 
but because of the fault, the basalt in that sandstone was lifted up. Now things that are lifted tend to erode faster. So all that sandstone on top was eroded away, leaving just the basalt. So basically, the basalt was pushed up through compressional forces along with the sandstone on top of this. And that's why you see the uplift in the falls here today. All right, so we have another question for you guys. So I don't actually think I said exactly what named it, what it was, but if you know what type of uh, forces are working on it, you can figure it out. All right. Boy, everybody's paying pretty good attention. Reverse fault, that's absolutely correct. Compressional, compressional forces push that rock up and over, that overhanging wall over, which gives us a reverse fault. Great job, guys. All right. So we have compressional forces in the area. Uh, now that, so the area is sunk, we've had uh, sedimentation all in that area because of water, uh, basically, it's filling up this basin with uh, shale. Remember, we talked about shale in the beginning. Well, that's important. So we have an area of, of, of tough basalt. You know, when it goes by hardness, you have agates, then you have basalt, then you have sandstone in your, your sedimentary rocks. Well, shale is a metamorphic version of sedimentary rock from mud and stone. It is, isn't as hard, and it, it doesn't have the strength that the basalt does. So in come the glaciers. Now, uh, basically these, these giant glaciers come in and uh, what I wanna get you to get out of this slide is basically uh, a lot of the basin with, and a lot of the lakes in Minnesota you see are from this, as this active ice, this moving ice slowly moves over, it leaves area of dead ice. And some of the ice could be covered by, uh, you know, uh, pieces of rock and, and gravel and sand, and others were just left open. But as the glacier retreated, these turned into lakes. They call these kettle lakes. And it, uh, that's how many of the lakes in the area were formed. And a moraine is just basically, uh, and can cause lakes because uh, as the glacier went out, it left a lot of sediment, and that's called a moraine. And we're gonna take a look at uh, a little better example of that here in a second. But so the glaciers, so basically the, the glaciers that came over uh, North America was known as the Laurentide Ice Sheet. And so this is kind of giving you the basic makeup of a glacier. So in the center of the glacier, you have snow, snow, snow compacting, it compacts, it turns into ice. And as it does that, its, its own weight tends to push out that ice ever so slowly. Uh, so over time, glaciers basically move out. And as uh, when we look at, say, the Laurentide ice sheet, the glaciers that went over our area were like two miles high. In the center of the ice sheet, it was like three miles, if you can imagine. Now, what do you think that's doing to our crust? So we already have uh, the, the sinking of the crust from the heavy rock, right? Now we're adding tons and tons of miles worth of ice on top of this. And it is really just pushing that crust down. Because again, the crust is just running over the mantle. And uh, compared to other areas that don't have large volumes of ice or heavy uh, mafic rock, 
it sinks much faster than uh, or a lot of the other areas are the crustal rock aren't sinking at all so we're getting a nice good depression here right well glaciers do another thing as glaciers push across they pick up loose rock and once they get that loose rock they start using it to grind and and break apart the land underneath it as it moves and that makes more loose rock and so basically you have this sandpaper effect it's like this big plow you know with the boulders and sand just pushing the ground so we have boulders here in in minnesota and wisconsin that are from ontario because uh, the glaciers just pulled all that that rock down now remember we have a softer rock right so even though lake superior really isn't a ribbon lake this is kind of the same process it, it doesn't the glacier doesn't erode that basalt as much, but then it hits that shale that's been accumulating in, in that basin because of the, the subduction due to that heavy uh, mafic rock, and bam, it just tears through that stuff. And we'll take a look at the, the way it looks today and how we can see how that's the case. It just tore up all this shale and, and took it with it and ended up depositing it in, in Minnesota and, and Wisconsin. So here's a good example of the Laurentide ice sheet. Uh, basically, this is the glacial maximum, uh, how far it went. And uh, I want you to take particular uh, attention to, we see Wisconsin. Minnesota got pretty much got covered. And this is the glacial maximum, right? Uh, but the Wisconsin, Wisconsinian period of, of glaciation was the last one. And uh, it started to retreat about 18,000 years ago. But because it was the last one, everything that uh, came before, because these ice sheets would move forward, then melt back, then move forward and melt back. But there's really only evidence from the last one as far as the exact shape of it because it pushed all that other stuff that the other glaciers left right uh, forward. So basically, we're left looking at the, the glacial maximum here. And so if you look, and this is an example of uh, the ice retreating. Basically, this was Lake Duluth, and you can see it. It basically uh, was up near where Skyline Drive is today, if you know anything about Duluth. But it tended to, uh, the river flowed out down towards where the Mississippi is. And there's a, on the other side of the lake, there was a Lake Minam. And it, basically as these, these ice sheets retreated, they, they, they left the rock where as far as they pushed out and then basically filled all those cavities uh, with water. And that's what we see with Lake Superior. So the last place we're going to look at is we, there's evidence of these glaciers running over this region all over the place, whether it's moraines in Wisconsin, and we'll take a look at those, or we actually can see where the, the sandpaper nature of, of, of the glacier over basalt right here in Duluth at uh, the mouth of the Lester River. So let's take a look at that. All right, today we're here in Northeast Duluth at the mouth of the Lester River. It's pretty easy to get to. There's a parking lot just up the hill a little ways. Uh, so basically we're here to look at evidence that glaciers came through. We know they went farther south because of the evidence we see in Wisconsin and Minnesota of deposition when they, they retreated. But here, right in Duluth and throughout the Lake Superior Basin actually, you can find basaltic uh, flows that were overrun by these immense glaciers. At its peak, the Laurentide Ice Sheet, uh, the, the, it was dome-like. So the farther you get away, it, it wasn't as high, but it was three miles in the center. And around this area, probably about two miles high, if you can imagine that. And this immense weight, along with its grinding up and carrying a lot of debris with it, it's slowly making its way across this landscape. And it leaves glacial striations in the basalt, you can see a lot of the sandstone in the area was actually 
picked up and carried away. And we'll talk about how that had an effect on the actual making of the lake. But by looking at this beautiful piece of basalt, we can see how the glacier slowly just moved its way over, carving these striations. So basically all I talked about at the end of that video was the striations. Basically, uh, you can see the direction that it basically, the Lake Superior on the western end, it, it, you can see how the glacier moved down uh, towards the Duluth area from like the center lake. So looking at this, remember the map of the Laurentide Ice Sheet? Well, this is how they came up with that map. You look, you can see, how far out, I mean, just like on the map. So the Driftless area is that there's no evidence of glaciation there, but everything else pretty much follows that. And these are called moraines, right? It's the, that sediment that was left. And again, there's other till, but these are the large areas or the, the large amounts were at the, the forefront of those glaciers. All right, so we're looking at Lake Superior here, the deepest spot being over here, but just, and this is the evidence right here that we know that the, the glaciers went down this way, right? We had evidence right here of them pushing this way, this, this southwestern movement of the, that lobe, right? Where the Michigan lobe went south, right? And basically you can see how this was dug out. You have a basic north-south on this end of the lake, right? And on this end, it basically ran down this way. So just looking at the, the depth and the, the, the way the Lake Superior was carved out, we can kind of see how those glaciers moved across it, right? So how fast is the Western Great Lakes rebounding from the glaciers? I don't think I actually said this, but we'll see how many people of you know. It's my apologies. So remember, we have tons of ice. How fast do you think the earth is coming back up from all that ice being on top of, of the lake? All right, I know I didn't say this, but your intuition of, for the most part is right. It was 12 inches every 100 years. So if you can remember one thing that, that after the, the ice sheets retreated, the, the rebound effect, the isostatic rebound is 12 inches every 100 years. And one more question before we finish up. What are the four main processes that led to the creation of Lake Superior? Kind of like our main point today. All right, yep, that's very good. Accretion, rifting, deposit, and removal of sediment. Great job, guys. So, we basically went over uh, how the continent was made, how the continent broke apart, and all this heavy rock came in, caused the earth to sink, that sunken area was filled with water and caused uh, sedimentary rock to form and then the glaciers came and swept all that sedimentary rock away and uh, 
basically that's how Lake Superior was formed. There's a lot of resources here you can find. Uh, and a really good one I, I really like is uh, the regional geology uh, PDF here on the bottom, but there's uh, stuff here on rocks and the parks in the area. And there's a lot of things you can go out. I know I didn't hit everything uh, as far as geologic evidence of all this. Uh, there, there's a world out there for you to explore and I hope you get out to it. So Trisha, did we have any questions? Uh, before we get to questions, Ranger Steve, I wanted to thank you for that presentation, and I just also wanted to talk a little bit about our visitor center status. Uh, so as as what you can see here, the Lake Superior Maritime Visitor Center, um, we have on the top left there on that photo, uh, we've been doing vessel arrival and departure announcements. We have a cell phone tour outdoors that is adding stops as we speak, uh, outdoor guest services, we're answering questions for the general public. And then the outdoor gift shop is opening this week. The pod was just delivered. If you're outside our building, you can see it. As far as the Sulox Visitor Center, they have exhibits installed in the park, uh, vessel arrival announcements, and outdoor guest services. And for both of our visitor centers, we're kind of relying on the health and safety of our visitor, or looking out for the health and safety of our visitors to rely on health standards. So at this time, we have no official opening dates, but when we do, we will do a limited opening. And then I'm going to leave this slide up to leave you with what's coming up next week um, and any resources that you'd like to see, as well as our hotlines for the boats that are coming in and out of each of our different visitor centers in their canals. If you have any questions as well, you can contact this email here. And it would be super helpful if, if you could take about three minutes to fill out this um, survey at the bottom. And I'll post it in the chat function here in just a second so you can copy and paste it. But it's helpful to find out where our visitors are viewing from, what you're interested in, and how we did. So if you could take three minutes um, after this presentation to view that, that would be fantastic. So at this time, we do have some questions, Ranger Steve, for you. Uh, the first question is, what is the type of rock on which Anger Tower is built? So Anger Tower, uh, I think I might have mentioned it, but it's basalt. is is uh, mainly what it's built from. I think they took the surrounding rocks and, and that's what they built it from. Another question is explain classic sediment versus igneous. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I said basalt, I wasn't thinking. It's a gabbro, I think I mentioned gabbro. Anyway, what was the next one? Uh, sure, explain uh, clastic sediment versus igneous. So igneous is basically saying volcanic rock and clastic is your sedimentary rock and your your brecas and your uh, breca can come from uh, igneous rock but clastic is basically the broken up pieces. Uh, that's all it's saying, uh, basically conglomerate. Another question, what places in Duluth are best for seeing the striations? Well, uh, I have to say I, I enjoy the Piedmont trails and you can find uh, faces of, of uh, glacial striation on those. Uh, all along the Lake Superior hiking trail, there's uh, faces of basalt that have the striations. I find that the Lester River is one of the best areas just because there's a parking lot right there. It's just to the left, but when you're looking onto the lake, there's a big slab of basalt and it's just clear as day. You can see it, all the, the grooves and striations in it. It's pretty neat. Another question, what kind of rock is the point of rocks in Duluth? So the point of rocks is a mixture of basalt and gabbro. It's, uh, most of the rocks in this area are basalt or gra uh, gabbro. And again, you can dif differentiate them by looking at them. If you can see crystals, it's considered gabbro. If you if it does if you can't see crystals and it looks you know kind of uniform, then it's basalt. Excellent. Uh, what kind of rocks are the really big ones at the Superior Entry Breakwaters? <laughs> At the, that's in the front of our visitor center, folks, if you're not aware. 
Yeah, so I think those rocks were actually brought in from the Iron Range. So they're, they're kind of a mixture of, I think there are, from when I looked at them, I haven't really studied them too closely, but I think there is some basalt, some gabbro. There's also some, uh, some of the smaller rocks are nice. Uh, with, nice is just uh, basically a uh, really metamorphosed rock that has like layers in it. But you can tell if, if it's metamorphosed rock uh, just really quick by when you look at the crystals, do the crystals look stretched, not round and, you know, kind of uniform? If the crystals look stretched, then you have uh, metamorphic pressures on those rocks. And uh, both igneous and sedimentary rocks can be metamorphic after time, pressure, and temperature get to them. Uh, again, so you have like greenstone up on the Iron Range is, is a, a form of metamorphic basalt, and uh, um, marble is another one. Uh, where are some good places or times to look for agates? And of course, exercise LNTs and put those back. <laughs> yeah, so she <laughs> means leave no trace. And it's, you know, if you find something really special once in a while, it's okay to keep one. But uh, picking up a lot of rocks so that other people can't find them, you know, other people also enjoy that. So we, we try to encourage you to only, you know, be very, very limited on what you do take from the beaches. But the best places to look are places where we have sand or, you know, stone beaches, especially after big storms, because it tends to turn, whether it's pull away some of the dirt or actually bring new dirt up. And those are when uh, new agates are really uncovered. Uh, there's also, if you go to Cook County or uh, uh, parts of St. Louis County, but on dirt roads, you can actually find, uh, like on Jay Cook Park, you can find agates uh, in, in some of those quarries in that area too. And I have a question for you. What's your favorite type of rock? My favorite type of rock is probably amethyst. I really like the, the purple quartz, uh, especially in geode form. Those are really neat. Excellent. Well, if there aren't any more questions, um, I think we're going to conclude our program today. Of course, we have another one next week at 11.30 a.m. Central or 12.30 p.m. Eastern. And that one was, let me pull it up here again, History of the Sioux Locks, prevented by Ranger Michelle. So we hope to see you again next week around the same time and be safe and have a great day. Thanks again for joining us.